Oh, Erin, I'm so delighted you could make some time in the busy end of this semester to chat a little bit. Yes, absolutely. Thanks for having me as the yes. year winds down. Well, and for people listening, Erin is one of the coaches in my circle of licensed coaches. So she's anti-boring approach trained and use those, uses those tools in her coaching practice. But Erin, you're here today for a lot of different reasons. So first, we're going to talk to students and parents about some experiences that you have had recently that I think are too important uh, related to mental health not to share about and share some resources for. So that's number one. And then number two, we'll stay on to talk a little bit about what's happening in the growth of your business because there are some very exciting things happening and you are even using some of the people who are being trained in the Anti-Boring Educators Club in some fascinating ways in your business. So we'll get to that towards the end. Um, but first, could you tell us about um, like the summary versions of those couple of experiences that you have had in the last few years with your clients who are really struggling mental health wise. Yes, so um, if anybody is struggling with self-harm, this is the trigger warning to let you know that I am going to be talking about some of those things. Um, if you or anyone you know is feeling suicidal, um, it's okay to ask, are you feeling suicidal right now? And there are a lot of resources for you. The biggest one is the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. And their phone number is 1-800-273-8255. And they also have um, Spanish speakers, deaf and hard of hearing, and texting. So anybody who might be struggling. But um, the last couple of years... My coaching philosophy has been to be incredibly immersive in the students' lives, which means that because of that, I am privy to secrets that they don't tell other people. And sometimes that's about substance abuse, and sometimes that's about self-harm and cutting, and sometimes that's about suicidal ideation. So there have been two times that I have either been the last call before somebody was attempting suicide, or I was, for lack of a better word, the rescuer. Um, so both of those students are still living. Think, 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 oh, think thankfully. Um, but yeah, so that's th those are some of the some of the ways in which I interact with students that go beyond just academic coaching. And that's one reason I wanted to talk to you during this time that I'm inviting people into my Rock Your Coaching program to learn the Anti-Boring Toolkit and my Rock Your Biz program to start their own businesses because you have a very specific model uh, that not a lot of other coaches have and not even I have. I, um, I have some time boundaries uh, with my clients where I see them during our sessions. I do text them. We do develop a loving uh, relationship where we're, we are connected to each other, but you uh, go above and beyond as far as that's concerned. So can you maybe paint a picture about what you know is different about the service you provide first? And then we'll wrap back to talk about those two experiences sure. you had. So I come from a world of nannying and governess work where I did homeschool lessons for families. And so I love being in the thick of it and I love being part of the family. So one of the things when I started my coaching business um, that people told me was don't drive all over the, all over town. But to me, that was important. So I do. So I meet them at their homes, at their schools, their local coffee shop, their libraries, um, because I feel like meeting with them in an environment where they feel comfortable, I just bond with them so much stronger and so much better. And I know their siblings and I know their pets. Um, I go to their school concerts. I attend their soccer games and their football games. Um, I form like a wraparound service. So it's more than just the academics piece. Um, I also have a rule for my students that they can contact me anytime. So text me, email me, 
call me. I'll get to you as soon as I can, but I will get to you. I promise. And so sometimes students will write me at 1130 at night or two in the morning. And to me, I'm a late I'm a late owl, night owl, so that doesn't bother me anyway. Um, but I, I love having that type of relationship with my students. So it, when I worked um, privately for colleges and public schools, um, I would get told that I needed to set stronger boundaries because I would give them my cell phone number. Mm -hmm. And in fact, one of those times that the student had my cell phone number, I was the last call that he made. And I so... I, I believe very strongly that the boundaries are whatever you want to set with the family, whatever feels good to you. And they don't have to be the same for everybody. And that's okay. Right. Right. Yeah. And um, I bring this up now, especially because we in the academic coaching world and teachers I know in schools are getting, are seeing more and more that there really is a growing mental health crisis among students. Uh, I mean, it's, I think it's been there for years, but obviously the pandemic exacerbated it. And we were in uh, a, our inner circle call, we call it inside the club where people who are licensed coaches, we get together once a week to chat with each other. And you came in having just had an experience where you were the rescuer of one of these students. And um, you were pretty distraught about it. And understandably so. And it, I think it's one reason why I'm so grateful on behalf of you that there is a community to love and hold you and support you so that you can love and hold and support the families that you work with. Yeah, I think um, the parents of these students are frequently don't know what resources there are. They're feeling helpless. The student is clearly feeling pain and helplessness. And so when I'm there doing triage work, you know, working with them as a family or talking to them about what just happened or setting them up with support services or liaising with the school to make sure that they're not going to fail all their classes for missing a week of school for going inpatient or whenever these things happen, I have to put on that, like, we totally got this. We're going to be okay. You're supported. And so to be able to come to the community and be like, hi, everybody, I have not slept. And I just have a big emotional release. I just need to kind of cry and just let everything out is, is really cool because there aren't a lot of other places where you can do that at work where you're allowed to cry or you're allowed to say, here's what happened. I totally got it under control, but ugh, I'm feeling like I need some attention right now and people step up for you. This work is deep being an academic coach. I mean, being a teacher is its own kind of deep and you do have some intimate view into the students' lives, but we see everything. Mm -hmm. We see parent-student relationships. We see difficulties on all kinds of different levels. And so it takes its toll and it's important to have our emotional support team around. And I'm just so grateful that um, you get to be mine and I get to be yours. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, sometimes we see, I mean, we see families whose parents are going through a divorce. Mm -hmm. We're sitting at their dining room table as the parents are fighting. Yeah. You know, I mean, I'm there when a student goes to a party and gets blackout drunk and calls me because they don't want to call mom or dad to pick them up. Like those are some of the situations that I'm in, but I would rather have them have a responsible, trusted adult than not have that. So that's why I have such loose boundaries with my students. Yeah. So um, this young person who you just had the experience with before this call, you told me that he's actually even writing his final paper in one of his classes about his mental health experience. Yeah. And I think it might be useful for students if they've made it this far into the video um, to hear a little bit. You can either summarize what he's writing about or if you feel like it's appropriate sure. to share some of his words, but I want people to know that they are not alone if yeah. they feel any of the things that you're about to describe that this young person uh, feels. Yeah. So for this student, he has been having some self-harm 
thoughts for a while, lots of feelings of worthlessness, of being a loser. Um, he talks about how he doesn't want to bug people with his problems. Um, asking for help is embarrassing. Asking for help means that he's weak in his mind. Um, and people are too busy and have more important things to do than listen to him complain. Um, his parents are loving, wonderful people, but they're very um, head centered rather than heart centered. And so when they talk to him, they say, well, look at all the resources you have. You have this and this and this and this, but he doesn't see those or he can intellectually know that those are there, but doesn't feel that, that, that they're supporting him. Um, he is very sensitive. So when the parents get mad at him, he's scared that their relationship will be forever destroyed and he has ruined their lives. And so those That's are what he's scared that he's scared that he's ruined their lives. Yes. Yes. Um, his parents don't have any specific grade expectations for him, but they want him to try. And he feels like nothing's ever going to be good enough for them, even though intellectually they've expressed that that's not how they're feeling. Um, and because of his executive functioning challenges, he forgets things. And instead of just saying, oh, that's a bummer. I can't believe I forgot that. Let me fix it. Instead, it's like, I'm so stupid. I shouldn't have forgotten that. So there's a lot of like self-hatred that comes into that. And then there's all of the typical adolescent social things. You know, I like a girl who doesn't like me, or I like... I'm having a problem with a friend or there's this person who I'm hanging out with who I've been very close to in the past that now is kind of acting like a jerk and I don't really want to be friends with them, but I don't know how to break up a friendship. These are all things that are happening in his life as well. So all of this is happening. And so he had an attempt um, a little while ago and he reached out to a friend and the friend got him help and told the parents and they took him to the children's hospital here and children's hospital told him we don't have any beds we're totally full the mental health crisis is this way take him back home and the parents said like okay what are we supposed to do like just take his door off like what he wants to do They're like yeah you can try to find an outpatient program for him because all the inpatient programs are full so they looked for outpatient programs they all had about a nine to ten month wait list because this student's family happens to work in the medical field and they have financial resources, insurance, stuff like that, they were able to pull some strings and get him into an outpatient program that graduated him the Tuesday before I found him in distress. Mm -hmm. So the outpatient program asked him if it helped, he said, uh, the first couple sessions did, but then beyond that, it was just people kind of complaining about the same problems I have with nobody's really willing to help us or teach us how to, how to solve them. Um, I had been a scribe for him for one of his classes and we submitted the Google doc, his words and I would just type them. And the teacher looked at the Google doc and saw that I was the one who had done the typing. So had some concerns about cheating that I was doing the work for him. And he was embarrassed by that and angry by that. So he punched a solid cord door and broke his hand. And then he snuck in to the parents, like taken all of the alcohol and all of the sharp utensils out of the house, but he had found a $300 bottle of scotch and decided that he was going to down that. So he did that. And so he just started kind of escalating, getting more and more desperate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so when you uh, happened upon him, he was walking down the street heading to do harm to himself and you just happened to be driving somewhere and happened to have been annoyed at your partner for <laughs> stopping at a yellow light rather than going through it. But that stopping at that light meant that once it went green and you kept on going, you were able to see this young man intercept him and get him. It was absolute kismet. I mean, there's no reason that we should have crossed paths. It was miles away from his house. It was pouring down rain. I was running late, which is not my normal. I, 
it, it just, everything had to align perfectly. Yeah, my partner stopped at a yellow light. I was annoyed because we were already running late. I see this guy walking. It's pouring down rain. It's windy. It's freezing. He's wearing a t-shirt. I'm like, why is this guy wearing a t-shirt? So I watched the way he walked for a minute, thought he looked like my student, looked at his hand, realized that guy has a broken hand. Wait a minute. Pulled over, caught him as he was walking to a bridge and ended up taking him home. And um, when we got home, mom was on the phone with 911. Dad was out looking for him. Mm-hmm. And mom said, oh my God, you know, thank, thank God you're here. And she said, who's with you? Oh, Aaron. Oh, you called Aaron. He didn't call me. I just happened upon him. He had left his phone, his wallet, everything at home. So he had no resources to get home and he wasn't going to, he said he had second thoughts, but at that point he had already started that way. And felt like he should just finish yeah so I feel like at this point we need to name if any any people students or adults are watching this and feeling some of those same feelings that your student was feeling let's remind them again at at that point call someone you know if you can call or text the suicide prevention hotline can you can you name the the number again yes um it is 1-800-273-8255. 1-800-273-8255. They also have an online chat feature. Mm-hmm. Um, but and that's such an important point, because as you told me before we started hitting record, many young people don't want to make a call and talk voice to voice, but they are willing to chat. And so please feel free to initiate that chat. And the other thing I really want to underscore is if you are having any of these feelings, even if they're not to suicidal ideation, anything. Like I feel like cutting myself to yes, I feel like I am going to commit suicide. Like you are not a burden. It is not bothering us to tell us that. Like if anything, I felt so grateful that I got to be able to help him. And I was on my way to a soccer game and he said, I'm sorry that you're late for your soccer game. I don't care about soccer compared to like this student. The student means everything to me. That's way more important. And I told him at any point in time, you call me and we'll go out and get milk, milkshakes. Like, I don't care. There's nothing more important than having you in people's lives. And I know it may not feel that way all the time, but I, and I know these parents, I mean, I know it would absolutely devastate them if this happened, even though, yeah, so you are important. And so please, 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 please reach out to a friend, to any, a teacher, anyone you feel like you can trust because people do want to help. And it feels true. It's a thought that feels true that you are a burden or that you are too much or that you are worthless or whatever the thought is. That thought does feel true and it's not true. Right, right. Our minds sometimes can trick us Mm -hmm. into thinking that Um, there is a man who jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and survived. And he goes around and does a speaking circuit now. And he said that he was dead set on it. So what he did was he got a running start and put his hand over the railing and hurdled it. And he said, as soon as his hands left that railing, he immediately regretted it. And was like, no, 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 no. I, I, I can't stop this. And luckily, a seal actually ended up saving his life. Yeah, it's pretty interesting story. Um, But, but now he goes on a speaking circuit, you know, about about that. And so one of the things that I say to students a lot is like, you're in the middle of this thinking, and we need to slow it down. Like, we, we can fix mistakes that have happened unless they're permanent, right? The permanent ones death essentially I, I can't fix but if you're like oh this person's mad at me and my parents are mad and you know I got bad grades like all of that stuff can be fixed it's it's trivial and if this is your typical lifespan how big is this moment that's taking that maybe this big so like okay you're in it right now so it feels big but let's find a way to minimize that so we can move on and have like the rest of our life so yeah So I'm going to make a little bit of a pivot now, but I'm going to try and transition us to talking about something that's very different topic. Um, But maybe first, I I just actually, I'm going to interrupt where I was going to head because we've we've told students uh, or people feeling these feelings, um, 
what they can do to potentially support themselves by, by calling or texting that line and, and maybe trying to slow things down so that they don't believe those thoughts as extremely. Do you have any tips for parents who start to discover that their student may be on this trajectory of um, harming themselves? Yeah. The first thing I would say is don't be afraid to confront them in a loving way, but are you thinking of suicide? is an okay question to ask. And what they find in mental health first aid and a number of resources is if you ask, a lot of times if the person's feeling suicidal, they'll tell you. Um, another thing is if you start to notice that they're giving away possessions that were really important to them, or they're you know, not making any plans after a certain date, it's okay to say, do you have a plan? Have you been thinking about this? And then the other thing is just shower them with love and let them know, that whatever they're feeling, you guys can work through it together. And I think that that's so key because kids don't want to make their parents mad. And the parents say, I'm not mad, but why do you have to keep doing this? It's like, I'm not mad, but they concentrate on the but part. And so the question is like, I'm not mad. I love you. I'm not mad. Let's try to get you some support. Let's, and whether that's talk therapy or medication therapy or psychiatry, there are a million resources, but, and there are also a lot of support groups for parents out there um, as well, but just let the teen know that like, I'm a safe person to come to. You can chat with me. I'm not going to get mad at you. I would much rather have you come tell me that you're feeling this way than find you in your bedroom. And the thing that I would layer onto that based on what I remember from some of the stories you've told us in the past is it can be tempting because you're so frightened as the parent when you find out you're so frightened and it can be tempting to lash out in anger. Like, how dare you scare us? How dare you? Da da da, you, da da da. You should, you should be aware of how privileged you are, whatever all of the things are. And it makes so much sense that you feel scared and angry. And totally. this is a really important time to actually drop into the love and be coming from that place. Because whatever your fear and anger is in your head, you better believe that the other person, your student in this case, has even louder, angry and fearful voices. And so your job as a parent is to regulate yourself to help regulate them. Yes. And because you love brain science so much. Um, during those times, your amygdala is triggered. So you are in posture, fight, flight, freeze. And so you are not using your prefrontal cortex, your rational brain. And so you're not looking at like, oh, I do have access to tutors. I am able to ask my parents for help. Like, that's not what they're thinking. They're, I don't know if you've ever seen the flip your lid thing, but this is like the brain, right? And then you flip your lid and your amygdala like takes over and hijacks the brain. That's what's happening for them. And so you can say to them all of the intellectual things that you want, but they're not hearing that they really need to feel right now. And they need to feel secure and safe and protected. And then once they calm down, then it's an appropriate time to have some of those conversations. Yeah. So I know a number of people listening probably have the following question in their mind. So I'm just going to go ahead and ask it, which yeah. is where is the line between being a therapist and a coach? Yeah, great question. So a therapist is, in my opinion, somebody who prescribes can prescribe medication potentially. Um, I don't do that. I also don't diagnose. I won't say like, this is what you have. Um, if there are things that are beyond my ability in terms of severe mental health and inpatient program, um, regular counseling, I work a lot with students who have a regular counselor that they meet with as well. Um, I am not their primary support for mental health things, but I can say, we're feeling stressed. Let's come up with a list. Let's come up with a menu of things we can do when we feel stressed, right? Let's do mindfulness activities. There's a YouTube video of a, a picture uh, and it expands as you're supposed to breathe and then contracts as you breathe and you're supposed to breathe along with it. Like, great. I can show you that. Like I can find tools and help with that just like I would with an academic setting. But if it's something that needs to be more clinical, then that's where yeah. A, a mental health professional would be more no, appropriate. 
the image that just came to me was, you know, those signposts that have all the arrows going in different directions saying this thing is that direction, this other thing is this direction, and they're all pointing. I feel like a coach does that. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, actually more than sometimes, a student is unwilling to see a therapist. I've had this happen countless times there, but they are willing to see me. And so I am clear with the family, I'm not a mental health expert. And I can start talking to the student and uncovering what some of their needs might be and seeing if we can access their willingness and then point their way. Point their yes. Way to those resources. Yes. And in addition, sometimes uncovering some of those things gives the roadmap to the counselor, right? You're like, hey, here, here are some things that they've identified. In this case, the student just came out of an intensive outpatient program. So you would think that they have mental health supports, but they still felt that way. And so in, in that case, I don't feel that it's appropriate for me when I catch him walking to a bridge to be like, oh, I'll see you later. This is kind of out of my, of course not right? That's not going to happen. And when I get there and I see the family in distress, I'm not going to be like, well, guys, I have soccer. So see you later. Like some stuff is just natural being yeah. emotive stuff. Yeah. 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 <laughs> exactly. Yes. <laughs> and, um, and, and so if it was something where like the, the family needs ongoing family counseling appropriate would be to give them a, a referral to that. Yeah. So when you first came to me, it was, I don't know how many years ago now, five, maybe? Five. I think five. Yeah. Okay. So when you first came to me, you already had a successful business. You had been in business for a year. And because of your amazing Aaron magic, you had grown that business so successfully that you were burdened by it. Yes. You, will, will you just tell us a little bit about, go, go back there to that time and tell folks how you were feeling and why you were feeling that way. Yeah, you say go back there, but I still feel that way because for me, I don't wanna say no to anybody. I want to help as many people as I can. And that's the empath in me that like, oh, oh I, I will help them, sure. It doesn't matter that I won't sleep at all. It doesn't matter that I won't have time to go to the bathroom during the day. It's fine because I'll be able to help these students. And the reality is that taking care of yourself so that you can show up for students is necessary. And there's, you know, we all have our own self-talk stuff, right? And mine is like, oh, well, if I don't, if I let them down, then I, I don't want them to not have a super great life or not do well in school because of me. And so I was taking on at least double the load I should have, maybe even triple. Um, and so I felt like I'm working all the time. I'm spinning my wheels. And although I love the work and I love the students, I'm tired. Mm -hmm. I'm tired. And because I am so connected to my students, I get a lot of referrals. And so more were coming in. And I thought, I feel incredible anxiety saying no to these people. Because I don't know where to send them. I don't know what to do. And so I joined your community because A, I wanted to find people that did similar work to what I did. I had been in a teaching world and that was a little too directive. And I had been in a pure coaching world. And that was not for minors and was for more like life coaching and executive coaching, not executive functioning coaching. And um, so I felt like I sort of didn't have a place and I couldn't find people who are sort of doing what I was doing. I also wanted to see if people are doing what I'm doing, can we work together to build resources? Because I think that there's this piece when you talk about entrepreneurship that gets fed to you online about competitiveness and you have to have a million dollar business and you have to do, 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 do and you have to have a sales funnel and, you have to, and it's like oh my god okay and it's like really you don't have to have any of that all you have to have is a population that needs something and trust me there's need so we don't need to be competitive with each other we can be collaborative with each other and instead i get new resources and i give you my resources and together we can help way more people than I can as one person. And in your journey, five years later, you've now hired several coaches. 
Yeah. So no longer trying to do all of that work by yourself. And we even had a really sweet conversation, I don't know, maybe a month ago now, where you said, Gretchen, I, I need more coaches, but I don't want to quote unquote poach them from the educators community. So you, even you were buying in in that moment because we feel anxious. And so we believe thoughts that aren't true. And the thought that you were believing that wasn't true was that you were poaching anybody from me, right? And I don't really have a feeling of competitiveness. And in fact, it is such a gift to many of the people who come in to start Rock Your Biz who don't have any clients yet. It's such a gift to get two or three from you and to have a consistent income to um, and consistent practice while they're learning how to build their own business. And you don't mind if they build their own business. Some no. people who hire new coaches want to hoard them and don't want them to start their own business, but you are happy to mentor them while they're doing both. And they can stay within the community and use me to grow their coaching toolbox as well as grow their business. And then they're better coaches for you. Yes. And that's kind of what I've relied on you pretty significantly for is to train my coaches, because how do you teach somebody how to do this work? If they have a true desire to do it, that's the hard part. So if they already have that and they've already come to you and they already speak your language, they already know your toolbox and like, yes. Okay. Awesome. So it, it's, it's sort of like this shared common ground right off the bat. Yeah. I'm pausing because we just had a little blip, a technology, technology blip, and I'm waiting for us to land. I think we've landed back. <laughs> Thanks science. <laughs> um yeah so I also just lost the other question that I was going to ask you but I'll, I'll jump to another question that I wanted to ask you anyway how do you think um how do you think you have been of most service to our community I know it's a funny question and I have an answer for how I think you have but I'm curious how you feel you have I'm feeling emotional about that question because I don't often self-reflect of myself, self-reflect of myself, of course, of yourself. I don't often self-reflect and see myself as of value, though that is something that I strive toward always. And so I see myself more of a helper supportive role and I feel like in the community, I've kind of provided that. I'm like, you like my contract? Take my contract. You want to jump on a call? Sure. I'll tell you how I do things. You know, like in the corporate world, there's R&D. And I always say it stands for rip off and duplicate from one another because that's like what it is. Like just steal it. Like it's totally okay. And so I guess I would say just through um, being a resource. I agree. And the way you say that, being a resource, <laughs> doesn't contain the breadth and the depth that I feel you bring to us. Thank you. And there is um, an energy that you have, like an upbeat energy and a huge heart. Uh, the fact that you felt emotional now, it's not the first time I've experienced you <laughs> crying in one of our spaces. And that's, that's a depth too, that you bring that because you feel comfortable bringing your allness to the space, the other people who come into the space bring their allness too. Um, Thank you. you also show up, like you lead the July call when I go away <laughs> for the summer, you show up. You're always willing to show up for people just in the same way that you show up for your students. And that is really super precious. Um, and yeah. you allow me to push you a little bit too. So there, we, you, Erin now leads a once a month training call to train the, the people who she's hiring and she pays for them to be in the club. So they're there. And so, and you wanted to train them, but you were like, oh, I don't have the time to create a training and I have to put all the materials together. And then what did I say to you? Uh, you should just put it on the calendar and do it once a month and I'll invite the whole community. Okay. <laughs> Ready or not, here we go. <laughs> exactly. And though more importantly, you don't need to plan. Yes. You know everything already that you want to train to train your coaches in. You don't need to put together a perfect plan. Yes. 
Yes. Very well said. Yes. And, and a lot of people from the community have come to those and have reported back that they've learned stuff. So it's been great. They've loved them. And then you're honing your training and maybe you will over the next year or two, who knows, nail down specific things you want to hit in those calls. Or maybe you'll just use the recordings that we've made, you know, to use them as trainings. But some, some of us joke that you be careful what you say out loud to me because there's hashtag Gretchen made me do it. <laughs> and I think most of the time people are grateful that I make them do the thing. And in this case, has it worked out well for you? Oh yeah, great. And I think that there's a certain piece of us that's scared to take that leap, right? And if you're in Gretchen's thing, you'll learn about the saboteurs. And for mine, it's like, I don't have enough knowledge. I haven't learned enough. I'm not good enough yet. I don't have enough. I, the product isn't perfect yet. No. And so you're like, Hey, you're jumping now. It's yeah. your turn. Go I'm like, okay. Yeah. Scary, but valuable. Well, I'm just so grateful for you. Aaron and I got Thank to you. share a hotel room recently at the learning in the brain conference. And that was so fun. Yes, it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had a great time. So I think I'd like to wrap this up with whether you have any tips or suggestions for anyone who chooses to join either Rock Your Coaching, which is the smaller program for educators where they learn the anti-boring toolkit or Rock Your Biz, which is the larger one where they get their um, training or their business up and running. Do you have any tips for how to best make use of the materials inside our community? Yes. For, <laughs> yes, that's the end. No, just kidding. Um, for, for Rock Your Coaching, these are educators that are in the community. And for you, I, I want to stress that there's stuff coming at you all the time. You're constantly sitting in trainings and this resource and that resource and read this book. And now we're doing growth mindset and now we're doing grit and now we're like, okay. So try to latch on to like one or two things that you're like, yes, that's awesome. And just worry about that. I'm the type of person who I have obsessive compulsive disorder. I take medication for it. And I feel like I'm going to miss something. Oh no, I have to, I have to have every single piece. And so I see what other people are doing and I go into a shame spiral of, I, I don't have it as good as them. And there's, their thing is so much better. Their product's so much better. It's like, nah, you are cool. You're great. Pick one or two things that you're like, this is what I want to focus on. Focus on those things for a while till you really got them down and then come back and revisit. That's the great thing about the course is that like you have those materials. Mm -hmm. So like once you know them, you know them, like it's fine. Um, for people starting. I want to say one thing before you change over to that. It's one reason why I've structured the Rock Your Coaching program as a full year. Yeah. Because I know it's a lot and it gives people the time to, to, to dangle their legs in the river, or as Candace said, warm their hands around the fire and then go mm -hmm. away again and work, work and play and then come, come back again. And it really does take a year to truly get these tools and these concepts into your uh, what being. Being, there you go. <laughs> yeah, and, and I, I, would, I would also add, there's, there's no reward for first place. You don't have to finish it at breakneck speed. So I hear that a lot with, from people who have just joined the program, like, but that person's so far ahead of me. It's like, so? Like, do it at your pace, do it how you want to do it. Because one of the things Gretchen will tell you throughout the whole thing is that you have your own special sauce. And that's so true. And, you know, in the coaches that I've been hiring, I get, rec I get just the other day, I got an email requesting one of them instead of me. And it's the first time that's ever happened. And it felt so good. I was like, yes, because he can offer something that I can't. And that's okay, right? And so do it the way you want to do it. And take the time if you need to take the time. So I would say that there's also a lot of this like comparison, seeing other people's paths and like, oh, but mine has to be like that. And it's like, no, it really doesn't. Um, and that can be really hard. That's one of the voices in my head that's not always accurate, but I hear it a lot. Look at how pretty and shiny everything is that they're doing and you're just turning in a pile of crap. And it's like, no, actually like there's value here too. Um, and then the other, the thing I would say for business builders is I would caution you to think of it less as building a business and more as building relationships, mm -hmm. because that's what you're going to be doing. And if you can build relationships with families and schools and neuropsychs to where they like you, they trust you, they are putting their kids' educational future in your hands. And I don't take that lightly. 
for me, it's like that is a huge gift that they're giving me. And so I focus focus on it more of the relational aspect as opposed to like, do I have a million dollar business? No, I don't. Do I have students who care about me and bring me cupcakes on my birthday? Yes, I do. Way more important. Well, and we have a new training that we're incorporating into the Rock Your Biz curriculum this year, all about how to build authentic relationships, because some you are naturally gifted at that. And some people really need to be guided because we have such grabby energy that our culture has taught us. We need to grab hold of people and um that comes from a place of scarcity, right? So we have yeah. to reframe our minds and then learn new habits for how to actually build authentic relationships rather than relationships because you can give me something. Yes, and I would add that don't take failure personally because there are times you'll meet with a student and the student's like, I'm not ready for coaching. And you're like, what did I do wrong? You didn't do anything wrong. And then two years later, the student calls you and it's like, I'm ready. And you're like, where did you come from? Like what? So you never really really no, and sometimes a no is a blessing in disguise so take it easy on yourself so much wisdom see this is why you all want to come into the community and show up for Aaron's mo monthly trainings too right please come <laughs> so the last two quick things okay people who are attracted to me are weird yeah they have their own kind of weird so I want you to tell us what's your kind of weird tell us some weird things about you Aaron okay um I am obsessed with Mr. Rogers um, I have like all of the Funko Pop, Mr. Rogers. I have a trolley in my office. I, I students get me like they knit me Mr. Rogers things. Like I love Mr. Rogers. Um, I like roller skating. Um, I think that the food groups should be ice cream, candy, fried foods, and cheeseburgers. And that's what the four food groups should be. I don't know. And you have a dinosaur in your front yard. I do. I have a nine foot dinosaur in my front yard um, that I dress up for different holidays. But see, I don't think of that as weird. I think of that as normal. I know, which is <laughs> what I love about you. And you got bit by an octopus recently, right? I did. I got bit by a Pacific red octopus when I was trying to take it to safety. It bit me in the hand. Um, so yeah, I have a bunch of like crazy weird stories. One time I um, my car got stolen and I happened to find it. I was with a student and they were driving and we were, we followed it and like stole my car back. So like, I don't know. I just have like weird things that happen to me. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. Well, and then lastly, if people want to find out more about you, how can they? Okay. So Seattle success coaching.com tip for business builders. Um, don't make it super long because Seattle success coaching is annoying to type after my email every single time, but it is what it is. It so Erin at seattlesuccesscoaching.com or seattlesuccesscoaching.com. I'm also on LinkedIn. Um, I got married on leap day right before the pandemic. And so that's why I'm on here as Tempest, but my former name was Wilson. So I'm under Wilson on everything. So if you're looking for that, Aaron Wilson would be a better bet. All right. And Aaron, you're also, your business is also on my trained coaches page on GretchenWagner.com. Yay, it is. Yep. All right, everybody. Look Aaron up. Comment if you have questions. Email me at Gretchen at GretchenWagner.com if you want to know about more about my programs. And take care of yourselves, everyone. Bye, everyone. <laughs>